everyone to go ahead and get started. Good afternoon. My name is Todd Seving, and I am the Director of Counseling and Psychological Services here on campus. And I would just like to add my welcome to those of you coming from out of town. Welcome to Ann Arbor and to the University of Michigan. Um, I have the job of moderating this panel, which you'll see in your program is called Fixing College Mental Health Care, No Easy Task. Now, as we all know, the job of moderator is mostly getting to keep time. But uh, uh, I do have a couple comments just uh, to get us back into the swing here. Um, I think the job for all of us in the, in the next hour or so is to think about addressing some of the challenges in college student mental health care and the delivery of these services. We've had a wonderful morning of information, of speeches, of workshops, and it's, it's time for us to kind of fold into what is it like to be a student, which mentality helped us work through, on a campus. Um, and I would say campuses, big or large, there still is the issue of how the total campus comes to help students with mental health. Uh, we're fortunate to have a great panel to help us think through this. We have Richard Cadison from uh, Harvard University. You can look at the specific titles in your program. Marianne Udow, who is a senior vice president at uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan. Patrick Corrigan, who is from the University of Chicago in the Department of Psychiatry. Christine Girard, who is from MIT University in the Mental Health Services. Rachel Glick, who is from uh, the University of Michigan Department of Psychiatry. And Summer Berman, who is a graduate student currently at the University of Michigan and one of the co-founders of Mentality a few years ago. Um, in preparing for this, I took the occasion to reflect on some of the changes that we've seen. Um, I looked, uh, I dug it up, I looked at some of the old data from the Big Ten counseling centers, the 11 schools in the Big Ten, and I looked at some of the numbers in terms of numbers of students seen. I looked at 92, I looked at 97, and I looked at last year. When you look at that trend, averaging the number of students seen at all 11 schools, there has been uh, roughly a 42% increase in students seen at counseling centers. Uh, budgets and staffing have kept up with that somewhat, but remains a challenge. That's a lot of students. Also qualitatively, I think what we do has changed. Um, Sherry Benton and Fred Newton in terms of some of the presenting problems over the last decade or so. Um, psychiatric time at most counseling centers has increased dramatically. Uh, coordination of care among counseling centers, various uh, other units, departments of, of psychiatry, hospitals, all these issues were relatively, uh, I'm not going to say non-existent, but they just weren't at the forefront of universities uh, as little as a decade ago. Um, I think what remains is trying to create some sense of, of community on a university campus for students when we think about college student mental health care. And that's why I believe this conference is so uh, important and timely. And I thank uh, the whole team that, that uh, worked on this conference. Which brings us to some of the challenges. What we've asked the panel to do is spend a few minutes each um, on three central questions, although each panelist will vary a little bit in terms of how much they address a particular question. But the questions are, from your perspective, what are one or two pressing issues in college student mental health? From your perspective, what are one or two ideas to help improve college student mental health on campuses? And then a specific issue or an idea drawing from each of their expertise. They come from a wonderfully diverse uh, uh, point of view, and this could be clinically based, it could be data, knowledge based, uh, outlining a specific issue, and so forth. Um, hopefully we'll have time for a few questions as we've done in the other programs after the panel. And without further ado, we'll start with uh, Richard Cadison. First, I'd like to thank the university for inviting us. It's really exciting to be here. A great opportunity um, to mingle with a lot of people doing very interesting work and hopefully learning a lot from one another. I thought a lot about the main questions of what are the real key issues that we're 
facing going forward. And I really came up with two things that are the, the biggest challenges for us. One is how to reach students and how do we get people into care. And the second is how much care for whom. We've got limited resources, the demand is growing. It's a little bit of the no good deed goes on punished story. If we get the education out there, um, get people to recognize that depression is a very common problem, they come in, where are we going to find the resources to take care of people? And that's almost as big a problem uh, as not getting people in the first place. A few scary statistics that I wanted to share with you to kind of give a framework to this. And these are from the American College Health Association survey. Uh, I don't know if the 2002 data is out. This is 2000 data, but I think it's very similar. 65% of state college students report feeling hopeless. 45% report being depressed to the point where they thought they could barely function. And almost 10% felt suicidal. The other scary statistic is the antidepressant sales between 1990 and the year 2000, they've gone up 800% in the last decade. So that's kind of a framework for um, some of the challenges. Now, in terms of reaching students, I think it's great to have seen Natalia here, a couple of students from Harvard who are here participating in the conference. And I think one thing we all need to do is find better ways of creating a partnership with students that students will listen to other students and will have much more impact than mental health professionals and talking heads giving people information about these experiences. So we've got to find better ways to work together with students and get the word out that way. Um, various kinds of screenings, I think, are possibilities. Students are up very late at night and on the internet very late at night and I generally would like to be sleeping. <laughs> and there are online screenings that are available for students where, you know, if it's 2 o'clock in the morning, you're wondering whether you're depressed or you have an eating disorder, you can, you know, check that out. And if you hit a certain score, you get a little message that you want to call the health service. Um, so I think there's a lot of opportunity for education and, and using the web much more effectively. Um, I also think, I wanted to hit on a, one other point that I think is another really crucial thing. And that is engaging faculty and staff much more in understanding and recognizing these issues. The comment made by the graduate student about how difficult it is to approach a professor. One thing that we've done at Harvard, uh, which I think has been a, a really uh, great direction, is every year we have a caring for the Harvard community. It's about a week-long um, group of presentations, workshops, that involve students, faculty, and staff. And one of the interesting things that we've learned has been that many of the staff, you know, including faculty, financial aid people, people working in the dining halls, um, in hearing about the common symptoms of depression and recognizing depression are really the eyes and ears out of the community and have been able to you know, talk to students and make referrals. The other crucial thing in terms of reaching students is that there's a very brief window of opportunity to get students into care. And we can't use a managed care model, you know, call up today and we'll make an appointment for you in three weeks. And students is long gone in three weeks. And getting students into care within a day or two, I think, is crucial. And I'm going to talk in the workshop I'm doing later on about a triage system that we've borrowed from the University of Massachusetts where we have same day or next day quick contact with students so at least we can connect with them and then get a face-to-face -face appointment set up. Moving on to how much care for whom. Um, this is, I think, the real challenge we face going forward. It's very difficult to know where these sort of developmental issues end and, you know, mild to moderate to more serious depression begins. I think most counseling services find that 10 or 20 percent of students use 60 or 70 percent of the resources. And I think we have to think about whether you know, what system works best? Do we need to provide more intensive care for the students who are in greatest need? What about students who come in in early stages of depression where we might be able to do something preventative? And how do we balance the need for these resources and follow up? 
And are there session limits? Um, are there outside, you know, the outside resources in the community are much more difficult to access now because budgets are getting tighter everywhere. So it's harder to find low cost resources that students can afford. And also with the increase in antidepressant sales, um, you know, I'm, I'm also a believer in a combination of psychotherapy and medication when, when people have a significant depression. But the cost of medication is very high and there need to be resources and coverage so that students can afford medication. And, you know, I, I still sometimes, um, you know, go down to the coffee shop at the corner to meet the drug rep because they're not allowed on the university property so I can get my, you know, prescription samples and drop them off at the pharmacy so students can use them. So that's another uh, challenge we face. I think another thing that we need to be aware of is that many students want access care after hours. You know, that's when crises, those are very vulnerable times. Um, last year we had 600 after hours contacts. And trust me, my staff is not happy about that. Um, people often have to cancel appointments the next day because they're exhausted because we use our existing staff to uh, manage the on-call system. So that's another challenge in terms of resources and how do you take care of students um, in those time frames. I think others will talk about some of the insurance issues and other resource issues, so I'm going to stop right there. Thank you. Richard, it's uh, wonderful also to be here this afternoon. And obviously, I'm not going to talk with you from a clinical perspective or for someone who's been uh, who has been involved with college um, and healthcare per se. But what I do want to share with you today is a little bit of what we see from the health plan from an insurance perspective when we look at the data that relates to what we think is happening with regard to access to care. And, uh, and give you some uh, takeaway messages I think that could help you think through how to improve access to care for college uh, age students. Um, because of the nature of this particular panel, I wasn't going to talk at all in the panel remarks about mental health parity, but I know that is an issue that is of interest to many in this audience, and I'd be more than happy to talk about that and what perhaps could be done to increase the likelihood of getting mental health parity in this country. Um, which I do think is a very important issue. But I'm not going to talk about it right in this moment because those were not the questions we were asked to address. So let me begin by just giving a little bit of background for a moment about the House of Shield of Michigan and why we're even interested in this <coughs> of depression. Um, we cover, for those of you not from Michigan, we cover about half the state's population, about four and a half million people have been across the Shield coverage in this state. Because of the nature of our organization, we are a nonprofit organization, we have a special mission in the state of Michigan. And our board has adopted a social mission statement that enables us and causes us to focus in a number of community wide issues with regard to health care. One of the issues that we have adopted um, with regard to our health agenda is the issue of depression. We adopted that issue for a variety of reasons, but a couple of them are that we believe depression is enormously underdiagnosed and undertreated in our society, in our community at large. And we believe there are a lot of costs associated with that undertreatment and underdiagnosis. So societal costs, obviously, in terms of the uh, ability of our society to function and people to get the kind of care they need. But there are also health care costs that we think are associated with undertreatment. It's a very important issue. We felt it was something we needed to highlight. And it is an under-discussed issue. Uh, and something, frankly, that many in the health plan world, many in the business world, are very uncomfortable talking about. And so we thought it was very important that we start to focus on this issue and raise some critical opportunities to improve diagnosis and care with regard to depression. So I'm going to show you one slide, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about our data, and then um, show you, tell you some lessons learned. Uh, and for those of you who are, don't have a public health background and are not familiar with the work of Jack Wenberg, I'm going to introduce you to uh, work that's been done with us here in Michigan by Jack and David Wenberg uh, from Dartmouth University. Jack uh, and David are both physicians and epidemiologists, and they look at variation in healthcare. They just came out with a, a major article as well covered in the press about Medicare variation. This happens to be data about the adult population within Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Michigan's covered enrolled population. These are all people who have insurance and who have coverage, pretty good coverage in our state for prescription drugs. So they would have coverage for SSRIs. We chose to look at this as one indicator. It's imperfect, and a lot of our data with regard to depression uh, and the findings I'll give you today are imperfect because it's claims data that we're looking at. And yet it's enormously instructive. 
What this map is showing you is the variation in health care that we see in our state, the variation in <coughs> use that we see with regard to uh, selective serotonin, serotonin reuptake inhibitors, SSRIs, the most common prescription drug today for the last to treat depression. And as we see in all of health care, but I think very important to note here with regard to this care, we see an enormous variation uh, in care. Overall, in the state of Michigan, about 6.2% uh, of our state's population, of our members, again, half the state population, does include Medicaid and Medicare, are getting SSRIs. Now, you know, you know, this audience knows the statistics, and even though SSRIs are not the complete picture on treatment for depression, what that says to us is that overall, we believe there's under-treatment uh, in the state of Michigan for depression. If you look at the map here, actually, if you live in Muskegon, you get the highest rate of treatment for depression. Uh, about 9.6% of our members uh, in Muskegon are being treated with SSRIs. But if you live in the city of Detroit, again, this is an insured population. We're not talking about here the issue of uninsured. If you live in the city of Detroit, less than 4% of our population, 3.8% of our population, are getting treated with SSRIs. Ann Arbor, as a community, is about 6.9%, actually not as high as I would have expected, just a little bit higher than the state's average. And here in this community, with tremendous access to health care and with a very educated population, you would think that there would be a higher rate of use of SSRIs than we're seeing here. So again, an imperfect picture, but an indicator to us that there is tremendous variation in how depression is treated uh, in our state and that there is overall significant underutilization and it particularly affects, we think, population groups uh, in, a, in a very different way. And again, in Detroit, there are a lot of reasons why we see underutilization of a number of services uh, in healthcare. So that's what I wanted to comment on with that slide. Let me, let me talk just for a couple more minutes about a little bit other, uh, of other data um, that I think is important and I think that can help be instructed as you're thinking about uh, college mental health care and what the issues are. First of all, when we look at our population by age segment, in the 18 to 22 year age segment, I'm just giving the overall statistics for the adult population, but in the 18 to 22 year old segment, less than 5% of that population are at least having claims submitted in any year, um, in, in a year, uh, related to depression. Now you've heard the statistics Richard just gave you about students who say they are suicidal, you understand, this audience certainly more than any other would understand about what we think is the true population prevalence of this disease in the 18 to 22 year old segment. And yet, even though these are individuals who have access to coverage, only less than 5% uh, are actually getting the coverage, at least as, that we can tell from their clinical experience. That percentage is much lower if you look at just males. Women tend to have a higher rate, still too low, but a higher rate uh, of treatment with regard to depression. Now there's been a lot of research and there are clinicians who might uh, have more of an explanation than I. I've certainly seen a lot of the statistics in the data that say depression is more prevalent among women. I'm not sure I believe that. I think that we may have, in fact, a significantly greater underdiagnosis problem and undertreatment problem with regard to males than we do with females. Females may be, in fact, more likely to seek care. Uh, females, depression may be better identified in females, frankly, because clinicians may think it's more likely among females. I think there is a very significant issue, and I would encourage you, as you think about the issues of college mental health care, to think about specific population groups like males and how they may, in fact, be more difficult to reach uh, than the female population. Now, the other statistic I want to give you, which to me was a very shocking statistic when I looked at these numbers, is the average annual cost of care for those who have been diagnosed, who have submitted any claims during the year that might relate to depression. Now, this is cost of care in all settings, prescription drugs, uh, inpatient setting, uh, physician setting, et cetera, not necessarily just related to depression, but it's care for individuals who we believe have a diagnosis of depression. The average annual cost of care for those who are getting some treatment for depression is $26,000 a year for the 18 to 22 year olds. That actually happens to be the lowest rate for any population segment that we looked at. But think about the cost of care for that segment. And here again, I'm talking about a 
an assured population, and frankly, a population where we negotiate rates with drug manufacturers and hospitals, and the cost is actually lower for that population. And even though we're not here specifically talking about the issue of the uninsured, think about what happens if somebody doesn't have health insurance, and they have cost of care that is in the $26,000, $30,000 per, per year range. Think about that segment of the population, and I encourage you next week in the state of Michigan and in many other communities around the country, we have a focus on covering the uninsured week. We will be doing lots of things about that issue, so not specifically related to depression, but depression takes an enormous financial toll as well as a human toll on individuals, and it is a critical issue that we must understand. The cost for those with depression is enormously higher than is the cost for those without depression. The last finding I would give you that I think can also be tremendously instructive for a population focused on getting care to college age students is that one of our findings in our data is that those who see primary care physicians have a higher rate of use with regard to treatment for depression than those who do not seek care from primary care physicians. That is because primary care physicians are often the first case finders. They're the ones who identify the issues of depression, and often they will intervene, at least increasingly, and that's one of the areas that we're focusing on is how to get more information and education to primary care physicians so they can intervene in care. But if you're thinking about a college student population, many of whom have left home, many of whom do not now have ongoing relationships with a primary care clinician, they are often here, and I just reflected back on my student days here, they're getting care at the health service when they have a particular acute situation. They don't have the access, or at least they don't have the relationships with a clinician who can observe and understand, and as you as clinicians understand, case finding with regard to depression, often people will come in not saying that they are depressed, but showing other issues or raising other issues, and it takes some sort of relationship with that clinician to be able to identify issues and opportunities with regard to depression. So I think how you overcome that disconnection from a health care system and from a primary care structure is very critical when you look at this population. So just to briefly summarize, the issues that I think that you take from this data, there are tremendous variation in care, overall tremendous underutilization, we believe, with regard to depression overall. It's probably more acute in the college student population because of that disconnection from primary care physicians and because of all the issues I actually heard about earlier from the students themselves about how friends and others, how much more knowledgeable people are about issues related to depression. And I think there's a significant area that should be focused on with regard to depression in young men. Tremendous under-diagnosis and under-treatment, I think, is there. So I strongly encourage you to consider those kinds of issues and those opportunities as you're crafting programs. And again, I'd be happy to talk about mental health parity a little bit later. Hi. I'm Pat Corrigan from the University of Chicago, and I'm here to talk about a barrier to service that's important for the universities and adult population as a whole, and that would be stigma. Some interesting numbers is that epidemiologic research has suggested a third to a half of people who meet criteria for serious mental illness will not seek care, both out in the community as a whole. There's no reason to believe that number wouldn't apply in a university setting. Another interesting number is about a third to a half of people who go into care do not stick to treatment the way it's prescribed. So there's some big barrier out there either dissuading us to go get treatment or dissuading us to keep with it. Some of the reasons are economic, some of them are political, some of them are psychological, and some of them are stigma-related. Just as a lot of people in the room study the biology and the behavior of the disease, so I come from a group who spends its time studying the sociology and the psychology of stigma. And over the last five years, really what we've been doing is ripping off social psychologists and sociologists who over the last 30 years have helped us to understand what is it to be stigmatized because of color or because of gender or because of other issues, and trying to apply it to this issue of mental illness. A couple simple things we figured out is applying and understanding the experience of stereotype and prejudice 
in people of color and women has some benefits for understanding mental illness, but you want a better comparison group. That comparison group would be gay, gay men and lesbians um, for two big reasons. One is that unlike um, being a person of color or a woman, you're not typically born with the stigma of mental illness or of being gay. It's something that comes on you frequently in young adulthood and therefore have to learn to live with it. The other one is for the large majority of people that are mentally ill or that are gay, they can decide to be in the closet or not. They can be hidden with it. So the issue for us is how come stigma is keeping people out of treatment? Well, if one of the reasons is you can be in the closet, and another reason is this is sort of a new thing, when you're a young adult and you're suffering with depression or something significant, uh, um, consistent with a psychosis, I mean, you have the shock and you have the decision to make of whether you want the brand on your forehead by going to the student mental health program and entering that group that you've been part of disrespecting your whole life. So the one problem with the stigma of mental illness is many people choose not to get treatment, which is the easiest way to get to the label. Many people choose not to get treatment to avoid the stigma. Another reason is that stigma in some circles is fundamentally an attitude. And one of the big stigmatizing attitudes I call the Dr. Laura stigma. I assume Dr. Laura Schlesinger at one time or another's made it to Michigan. Um, she's a talk show host who believes everything's a matter of choice and personal responsibility. And this personal responsibility. Pardon me? Sure. Right. Um, and so that applies to mental illness and communism and a bunch of other life choices. Um, the problem with the personal responsibility or blame stigma is first off, I don't want that depression thing on me because I'm not a sap, I'm not a victim, I'm not going to be um, responsible for this horrible thing. And the second, which may be even the more troublesome for seeking treatment, is consistent with personal responsibilities, I can fix it myself. And it's sort of a hidden thing. And looking out here, I don't see anybody else with depression. And you guys can fix it with yourselves, so I don't need to seek treatment as a result. The big interesting issue, though, is how do you fix stigma? And in the last 10 years, a lot of groups have looked at trying to change the stigma, both in the public as a whole, as well as people with mental illness who beat themselves up. Um, Later at a workshop, I'm going to talk about this much more, but simply put, you can do education or you can do contact. There are a lot of education programs out there. The National Institute of Mental Health is about ready to kick off a middle school curriculum trying to educate people on, on, on the biology of mental illness and the issue of recovery. Uh, much more relevant to the topic here is the National Mental Health Awareness Campaign, which is a group that Tipper Gore and Alma Powell set up soon after Tipper Gore left the White House, um, set up a series of public service announcements that you can see on their website at www.nostigma.org. The whole thing is oriented towards a young adult population trying to get people who are just struggling with mental illness to be open to the idea of getting care when they need it. So education is one thing people are gravitating to quickly. I'm a little nervous about the education idea because it's a quick way to throw money at a problem. And the controlled research we have done suggests that another more effective way of changing public attitudes about mental illness is contact. And the group like Mentality is probably a screaming example of what works well for contact. Is that when people come out of the closet, you can see for yourselves that people with mental illness don't have horns, aren't perverts, and aren't trying to hurt you somehow. And so it's a quick and effective way. I would suggest that if we were to learn from other groups who have suffered with stigma, perhaps in 10 to 15 years, the biggest difference we're going to find in stigma is many more people are out with their mental illness. Thank you. Hi, I'm Christine Gerard. I'm here from MIT. And on behalf of MIT and the mental health task force that I had the privilege to co-chair, I'm delighted to be here. And uh, especially so since Emma, uh, University of Michigan is my medical school alma mater. So it's um, like walking back uh, in some memory lane here. So it's, it's nice to be here. And I'm grateful to uh, 
John Graydon for hosting this and the University of Michigan and hopefully we, I can share some of our experiences at MIT but also learn from all of you. So, um, Like many universities, MIT also has seen a growth in its utilization. Um, in 1995, we were seeing about 8% of our student body. By 2000, we were seeing about 12% of our student body and it continues to rise at a, about a, a rate of 1% of the student body per year which obviously puts clinical taxes on our service. And yet, like the uh, previous speakers, I still believe that we are not seeing everyone. Um, we also see growing numbers of students who require ongoing continuous care or higher levels of care. We're seeing growing numbers of students in need of psychiatric hospitalization and growing numbers of medical leaves for reasons of mental health. Um, and I think we're not alone in that, um, but many of these folks that are in need of uh, higher levels of treatment really don't get to us until they need that hospitalization. They've you know, taken an overdose. And um, I think like Harvard, we're really trying to focus on those points of intervention where we can make a difference and to focus on the prevention side by broadening our education and outreach kinds of initiatives. Um, for the past couple years, we've contacted all freshmen before they come on campus, before they get cynical and throw everything that they get into the wastebasket. And we give them an introduction about the MIT medical service, including a lengthy statement about mental health and trying to normalize it to make sure they know where we are. And we've asked them uh, eight questions, asking for history of depression, history of suicide, if they want information, if they'd like a contact. And um, for everyone that answered yes to any of those questions, we contacted them and we sent out information and brought those students in. And I think that was really effective. And amazingly, we got a 100% response rate. This is, it was sent along with their um, medical information that they had to fill out. And they just saw that as, okay, this is something I'll do too. Um, and it was a point of contact that I think really worked. We are also working on broadening our education for residential-based supports. Um, at MIT, we have um, residences for the undergraduates that have graduate students, um, couples or singles living on a hall with undergraduates, and we've done training for them for a long time on mental health issues and other kinds of is issues. But in the past couple of years, we've really broadened that so that hopefully they feel more comfortable being a liaison to our service. <coughs> we have assigned someone from our mental health service to every living group, whether they're actually on campus or they're independent living groups, all the fraternities and sororities. And uh, there are meetings at the beginning of the year and throughout the year with the house masters and their mental health contact person so that they have a face. And I agree with um, the previous speaker about having a face. It makes such a difference when I or someone else on the service goes out to talk with the students in their living room, to, to go out for a study break and just talk about stress or depression. And it's amazing how many students then come, come to you afterwards and say, you know, I, I don't know if this is a problem or not, but I want to run it by you. Um, and so I think that face-to-face -face contact really works. Um, we are also gearing up to try to develop a social marketing campaign that will be a three to five year um, long campaign to really address things like stigma, the ongoing kind of personal environmental uh, barriers that are getting in the way of appropriate health, help seeking to foster more of a social network, sense of community, and to foster resilience. Um, we see students who uh, get to us and they're happy with the care, but many students just never get to us. And 
We're really trying to train broadly so that students can talk to their peers, they can talk to their graduate resident advisor or their RA, they can talk to their freshman seminar advisor, and if we're training broadly, hopefully we have more effective eyes and ears. So I'll stop there. I will talk more about the mental health task force and the workshop this afternoon. A little bit out of order on the panel right now. Uh, my name is Summer Berman, and I am co-founder of Mentality Incorporated. The, you saw the U of M chapter here just before. Um, but the reason I'm on this panel is because I'm also a graduate student here at U of M studying social work, and I did my undergraduate here as well. Um, and I'd like to touch some more on the issue of stigma and to thank Patrick for your kind comments about mentality. Um, and that, that whole idea is really what we're, what we're going for, of that um, contact and um, the idea of sort of not getting mental illness and mental health out there because it is out there, but opening people's eyes to it and letting them know that it is, it is around and it's something to deal with. A um, couple things about stigma. I think stigma is, in my opinion, the biggest barrier that, that we have right now in dealing with mental health issues in general, but particularly on college campuses as well. And stigma comes in a lot of different forms. Um, there is, of course, the general sort of um, social discrimination, um, social, social stigma that comes in the form of discrimination or either outright or just in, you know, in the way we speak and the things that we say, um, sort of throwing things off. You know, oh, that was crazy, oh my God, she's so psychotic, I can't believe she did that. Um, and so those sorts of behaviors that just kind of culturally come about, it really makes it not a very pleasant place to be for someone who either has a mental illness or is socially aware and doesn't really want to participate in those kinds of things. There's also, um, the stigma that becomes internalized to that. When you when you hear all those things going on around you, it's not very easy to say, oh, it's just what those people think, it's not true, I'm, I'm okay. Um, it becomes really a matter of, uh, it's very easy for an individual to, to begin believing those things and to say, I'm terrible and I deserve this and there's no way that I can get out of this. Um, and so there's that, there's that sort of internalized stigma as well. And then third, I think that there is a stigma that is even less um, sort of culturally aware, or less describable than the sort of social stigma that we talk about, where people will sometimes outright you know, say things about crazy people or say that they're stupid or say that they whatever. There's sort of a more silenced stigma in our, cultural, in our culture as a whole. Um, which leads us to not talk about the issue at all, which leads us to um, having students that don't know about services that exist on campuses and having services that might exist, but they don't connect with each other. They're very disconnected. They're very, um, it might be very difficult for a student to navigate a path through which services really apply to them or which services they might get help from. Um, in addition, there is this sort of cultural silencing stigma that really only becomes awakened um, for the most part, for most people in crisis mode, when there's no way to ignore it anymore, um, when things become rowdy, when things get bad, when someone commits a suicide, um, particularly on college campuses. That's a, a massive issue, and I think you know one of, one of the big things that, that's brought us all here today is, is suicide on college campuses is a huge issue. Um, but that's where we see all the action, and that's where we see all the, not all of the, but many of the services going towards. And I, I think that there is a greater need. Um, we're talking in one of my classes the other day about fear inoculation, which the term kind of turns me off. I don't really like it. Um, but the whole idea of sort of getting used to something that makes you nervous or gets you scared um, so that you can, you, can, you can deal with that issue. And we, I took a, a voice class in undergrad and we sort of did the same thing before we would go on stage, we would prepare and think about, okay, what's the most horrible, worst thing that could happen to me so that we wouldn't get stage fright when you go on stage. Um, 
something you sort of along that same idea of culturally bombarding ourselves with so much information about mental health and about mental illness that it's not something out of the ordinary. It's not, um, it's not something strange. Like we see all the time ads for our health services and everyone knows that you can get your, your flu inoculations here and everyone knows where you can get free condoms. Um, because it's just out there. It doesn't come out, you know, only on Valentine's Day can you get condoms. Like, it's, it's here all the time. Um, and so I think that kind, of, that kind of awareness and that kind of um, culturization of mental health issues, I think, is something that's really, really important. And I think groups like Mentality um, sort of bring that out and, and say, look, I, you know, I'm a person. I have mental illness, or I'm a person, and my best friend has mental illness, or my mom has mental illness. And, um, I just think that it, it's such, it's sort of both an ideal and something that could tangibly happen at the same time because I, I see it happening within mentality. And um, I'll briefly share a quick story myself, a personal story. Um, I originally, when I did my undergrad here at U of M um, and was a psychology major and was you know, very academically um, interested in, in psychology and how people think and all that sort of thing, um, and had had some friends and family members dealing with mental illness, but nothing that I really knew about very much. For me, it was much more academic interest. And I came to school, joined this group mentality, thought it was fantastic, and I'd been into social issues and, and uh, community service and these sorts of things. So this group was something that sort of brought all of those issues together for me and became a very important group for me. And by my third year of college, I started experiencing depression. Um, and I feel so lucky that I was entrenched in this, this culture of mental health awareness. The people around me, both, both in mentality and then the other people who I sort of collected to be around me who were open to that sort of thinking, were so incredibly supportive that I just feel lucky in so many ways that I, I know so many other people don't have the same kind of experience that I did. That I was surrounded by people that were extremely supportive. I was able to get, you know, seek the help that I need. I was able to, really lucky to have a couple professors that were really understanding to talk with me about it. Um, I only just actually last semester finally got diagnosed, but so I've been dealing with this for several years. Um, but I just really, the point I want to make is that it, it can happen, we can create cultures where mental health is something that we talk about. And it doesn't, I think it should be mental health, it shouldn't just be mental illness, because mental illness is something that happens, but mental illness will happen if you're not taking care of your mental health. We all have mental health there, whether you are well or whether you are ill, it depends on a lot. It, you know, it depends on your biology, it depends on your environment, it depends on all these things. But I, I think it really is possible to create environments where um, it's not something that's so out of the ordinary and it doesn't have to turn into a crisis. So I guess that is my, my takeaway point, is that it's, it's definitely a challenge, for sure. I won't say by any means easy, and I, like I said, I that I was extremely lucky, but I think that it can happen. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, I'm Rachel Glick, and I believe I was invited to sit on this panel from the perspective as a provider in the psychiatric emergency service where I do my clinical work. But in addition to being a psychiatrist and doing work in the emergency setting on a college campus where I see a number of students, I'm also the dean of students at the medical school. So I think about mental illness and students from that perspective as well. And I'm actually sort of glad that we switched places because I really want to build on some things that um, Summer just said. I see one of the biggest problems in dealing with individual students who need support and help on our campus because of depression or other mental illnesses or other life stresses being really uh, twofold. One is that we are a very complex place with lots of different silos where people can get help, but we don't talk to each other. In fact, in many ways, our, as mental health providers, our feeling that privacy and confidentiality is very important blocks us from being able to talk to each other. So I see that as a major problem. 
And I believe that the, one of the best ways I can provide help to an individual is by open communication, is by sharing information. I believe very strongly that what we need is a culture, a community, where we take care of each other. And if we're afraid to talk to each other because of betraying someone's confidence, that can be very problematic. Um, one story that comes to my mind, it wasn't a student who was depressed, but a student was brought to the emergency room, this was probably four or five years ago, maybe even more, but it still sticks in my mind, it's just the worst that can possibly happen in an institution like ours. But a young girl was brought to the ER and she was psychotic. And as an emergency psychiatrist, the first thing I think about when I see someone who's young and is psychotic is, is this new? In which case it could be some sort of medical or neurologic disaster. Or is this someone who's already actually has a diagnosis of a mental illness? So the first thing I want to find out before I start doing a lot of invasive tests and uh, you know, put the patient through things that might not be necessary is, does this person have a history of psychiatric illness? So how do you get that information? Well, the roommate who brought her in didn't know. Um, so I said, well, let's call her family. She's a U of M student. So I'll call the registrar's office and I explain that it's Dr. Glick, I'm a psychiatrist in the psychiatric emergency service. This is an emergency involving a student. And I wanted to find out who her next of kin, who her contact person is, so that I could call them. And those of us who work on college campuses and know the administrative stuff about the FERPA laws and such know that a student can actually put a note in the file that says, I don't want this information released. And this student happened to have done that. Um, so they said, we're sorry, we really can't tell you. And I said, this is a medical emergency. I believe that you actually can, in issues of health and safety, go beyond that, because I have the role of being an administrator too. And, um, and the person in the registrar's office said, no, I'm sorry, I can't give you that information. So I did the next best thing I could think of doing, which was to get out the phone book for the small Michigan town where this young woman came from and start calling people with the same last name. So I ended up calling the exact family member who she didn't want to get information about. And if the school had given me that piece of information, I would have actually been able to keep her confidence the way she wanted, although we couldn't get that from her at that moment. So I, to me, that story, and I could have been on the other side. I mean, I've also gotten calls from various hospitals and police saying, we need information about so-and-so who's one of your students. So I, I've been on both sides of that. But I think as an institution or as institutions of higher education, we need to figure out a way that we are part of the same team, that we can share information between our clinics, between the emergency room and the counseling service, between the registrar's office and the emergency room. And that, to me, I think, would really improve the services that we can give to individual students. Great. <coughs> well, please join me in thanking our panelists at this point. It's uh, been wonderfully stimulating from the different perspectives. We have intentionally left in about, about 10 minutes, uh, maybe 15, for some questions. And I know logistically it's a little hard given the size of the room and the group, but this is a wealth of experience from these six people to tap. Uh, three of them are giving workshops more in depth, as they mentioned, in the next part of the day. But let's take some time at this point to ask some questions and to get some questions and dialogue going. Yes? In the earlier workshop, we heard that at the University of Michigan, it sometimes takes three weeks for a student. A student goes through a maze before he, can act, he or she can actually speak to someone about what is troubling them. I'm curious as to what happens at Harvard and what happens at MIT. Is there a maze as well, or is there, you know, do you, do you see the student within 48 hours? System. So every day there are urgent care hours set up that students can walk into. Um, and we sometimes refer students into those urgent care hours um, depending on the circumstances. The system that we've started to develop, which I'm going to be talking about in the workshop, um, borrowed from the University of Massachusetts, but that works really well in the student population, is a triage system. So if a student calls up, they are given, we have 70 appointments a week of 
20 minute brief phone or face to face contact if they prefer that to meet with a clinician to get a quick picture of what's going on, what the concerns are, and then we can steer people. If someone's acutely suicidal, you know, they get seen immediately. Um, if someone had a breakup and wants to work on relationship issues, they might be seen, you know, our, our guideline is we don't see anyone within a week for an initial appointment. It never takes longer than that. Um, or the other, the other thing that's really helpful in this time when um, there's you know, tremendous strain on resources for prescribers versus um, people looking for therapy. Some people, you know, what they need may not be as relevant as what they're looking for. Some people adamantly don't want to talk about medication initially, and some people adamantly are on medication and do want to talk about medication because they're having side effects. So we don't want to, you know, refer someone in to see a um, psychologist or social worker who's having side effects from their Zoloft. And someone who doesn't want to talk about Zoloft, you don't want to take up an hour with a psychiatrist time to do that. So this triage really helps us point people in the right direction. And I think you know some of the other comments that people have made, um, the other sort of guideline at our front desk is if a second human being is bringing human being number one into the you know, calling up or bringing them in, you know, that's a red flag. That if someone's worried about the student and they need to be seen promptly, and we have you know good working relationships with resident deans. And um, you know, the other thing that has changed in recent years is is the technology. So if a dean refers someone over, um, and they're concerned about the student, they'll tell the student, you know, I want to give the health service some information. They'll call up our care management line and then call the front desk to make an appointment. The dean might call up, the student might call up, and if the student is going to see Dr. Smith, we'll forward that voicemail to Dr. Smith. So Dr. Smith hears directly from the dean, the friend, whoever it is, what the concerns are so that we have some information. And the same thing with the triage information that's passed on to the clinician who's doing the intake so they have a little bit of background. And one of the things we always ask about, you know, the, the two huge issues with student health is students not keeping appointments. We lose over 2,000 visits a year, 2,000 hours a year of students not keeping appointments. They don't call up and cancel them. And part of that is that students don't like a provider. You know, you know, we're not the perfect clinician for every student. And when students don't like a provider, they just don't call up or don't come back. And we tell students in the triage, you know, if this doesn't click, we do our best to match you up. You know, call us back and we'll find someone else for you to see. So that way, we also pass on the information. Student, you know, uh, needs a provider who's more active, who's more this, who's more that, so that it, you know, kind of keeps the person to be more effective. And the team, we have uh, same day appointments, uh, so that anybody can call the dean or a self-referral call that morning and say, you know, I, I really need to be seen today. So that's been in place a long time. We also have advertised walk-in hours Monday through Friday that are two to four. Essentially, they, they end up being two to five. We don't block that in last hour, but and usually gets a little bit. Um, so those are two ways that we can get in. We also borrowed the similar system that Harvard is using uh, from, um, from UMass and find that it's working well for us. We've been using that since April. And the same day somebody calls or walks in, they have a clinical contact either face to face or by phone for 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, it's a point of education about what the service can and can't do um, to elicit any preferences that the person has and who they might feel most comfortable with. And then they are put in into an intake appointment within a week. And that seems to be working well. And we get a lot of spontaneous positive from from students. We were a little worried that students might not be reachable because they're in class or they're off not in the dorm room, but um, because cell phones are pretty ubiquitous, it hasn't been a problem. What, what, one other comment, for the sake of full disclosure, the place where we're still having a lot of difficulty, and I think the, the other challenge is we get people in the door, but arranging follow-up is a big problem. And you know we're we're at busy time. We're back up two or three weeks for follow-up appointments, and you know that that is an issue. <clears throat> and and just quickly, Dan, I think an inherent challenge is is the difference between crisis intervention and counseling with a psychologist or social worker and a psychiatrist. I mean, at our place, we have same-day appointments. We have walk-in actually from eight to five every day. Um, so students can always walk in and be seen. To see the psychiatrist is hard. Um, that's where the, some of the weight happens, although we just increased that time and we may uh, also have some of the walk-in that um, they're talking about. So. 
Yeah, in the back there. Yeah, you. Dr. Glick, uh, from a smaller university, uh, Purdue, uh, the regional campus, and uh, the issue of confidentiality and teamwork. The teamwork is really important. I agree with that. We're small. We need to work together. But uh, it's like a small town. And one of the things I've had to work really hard with is maintaining confidentiality. And, ma and I, I, I know I've alienated some of the staff because I've refused to give up. Uh, I feel like that's what I have to offer students is trust and confidence. How do you balance that out? I, you know, obviously confidentiality is important, but I think sometimes we get we get so caught up in that I can't share information with you that we don't think about what sort of information can we share? Can we talk to a student about the fact that we are pretty socially isolated, we're worried about you. We really want to make sure that you have support and have a community around you. And we really need to talk to someone, your roommate, your RA, your mentor, your, your, your professor, um, who is there in your life? And I really, no, I, I, I see the student, when I see students in the ERI, uh, I feel responsible to them and on a different level. I, I'm very paternalistic. I kind of think of all the medical students as my granted older but children. You know, and I still and I still feel some responsibility. So when I see a, a college age student or a you know university Michigan student in the ER, I would really push to make sure that there's someone who knows they're having a rough time. Now I don't have to tell them the details of, you know, what are the stories that help me, but to say to a friend or a family member, you know, your your son, your daughter, your friend is having trouble and they need somebody to check on them to be their friend and to be there with them. And you know, the other thing is stigma. I mean, a lot of these students who say, no, I don't want to get to talk to anybody. But it's also depression. If they say, I don't want to be a burden. I feel guilty. All I do is drag around and my friends don't like being with me. And you know, nine times out of ten, you can talk them into letting us call that friend in or call someone in. That person is more than willing to be a friend and to help, but it's getting around them. And that answers your question. Good, Tom. Marion's comments about the importance of a primary care physician or a medical home reminds me, and I'm curious what other institutions have done. I would bet we're not alone in having multiple places where student mental health occurs and disconnected to any places where primary or specialty medical care occurs. And do you have any models or any suggestions on how to begin to better integrate and coordinate those students? Uh, I do. Uh, we uh, hold uh, incoming students to find out where they get their health information. And, you know, big surprise, 75 80% get their health information from their parents and their families. And in the last about three years, we've implemented a program where we try to get, um, we invite students to be assigned to primary care doctors. We have the same experience that you were describing, that if someone is, has a primary care doctor relationship, they will get into care much more quickly. And oftentimes, when I consult with deans and with uh, you know, residential people, um, students, you know, because of the stigma, you know, the first door a student's going to walk through is not the mental health door, but if they're feeling run down and having physical symptoms, they might go through the primary care door. And, you know, whatever door students will go through, you want to get them through some door. So it, I think it does make a big difference. And considering assigning people and having, it's an odd concept, and, and particularly with the increasing diversity, and we have a huge international population where the whole, you know, healthcare is a foreign concept to some degree, you know, in, in terms of how to access it. Our system is so strange to uh, international students. But suggesting that people make a, you know, meet your primary care doc appointment, um, and those who follow through that we have, you know, they get much better care. And it's, a, you know, it's an issue with people who come in, you know, after hours and then the care doesn't get coordinated as well. So we really urge that, and I think it can make a big difference, and it's an important direction to go and encourage families who give their students the information to uh, pass that on. The uh, MIT practice, the mental health service is within a uh, medical facility, so it makes it a little bit easier. Uh, we also assign, we invite students to select a primary care provider, but if they're not from the area, they often you know, don't know who to select. Um, but we say that we'll assign you if you don't select someone and you're well 
welcome to change, and we invite them to make a getting acquainted appointment at the beginning of the year. Some students do, some students don't, but if they do come in through the urgent care with you know, a sprained ankle or whatever, um, they can be um, told who their primary care doctor is and encouraged to make an appointment. So. Yeah, in the back there. To take Mary Ann up on her offer to talk about charity. Uh, I'm one of, my name is Kate Lennis, and I'm one of the uh, founding members of Michigan's Partner for Charity. And we're trying to get a state bill passed, hopefully this time, with a governor who feels differently about it than our last one. Um, I have bipolar disorder. When I got very ill about nine years ago, I ended up $70,000 in debt for treatment costs that were not covered by my insurance, $40,000 of which went to U of M, so I paid some money back. Um, <laughs> Let me just say briefly that there really are two issues that need to be dealt with with regard to parity. And, and here I'm talking about parity, whether we're talking about a federal law, state law, or employers making the decision, which they can, of course, do to voluntarily change their health benefits to cover mental health as they do other, other services. The two issues are, you know, really what this panel has focused on uh, is how people see mental health related issues, and that's a historical issue. Uh, it goes to me beyond stigma, frankly. It goes to a complete lack of understanding. And here, you, you need to understand that those who are going to really make this happen are those in the corporate world. This audience is an enormously educated audience, has a very different perspective. And I think that unless you've spent some time in the corporate world, you really don't have a sense of how those uh, who really influence policy in this country, either practically in terms of their own decision making every day or politically, uh, how they view this issue of mental health care. And, and if you heard Andrew Solomon earlier, he talked about Paul Wellstone's comments about those with mental health don't vote. It's more than that. It's also that money is very fundamental in our political system. And it is the corporations and the businesses who provide much of the money for campaign campaigns in this country, so they're very critical to this decision-making process. And they view, and I will tell you, even within my own organization, we had to do a lot to overcome a lot of prejudices about the issue with regard to depression and mental health care, and the belief that, frankly, by adopting this as one of our areas of health agendas, we were just going to enrich the pockets of the drug manufacturers in our country. And that is a very common view that I hear from my colleagues, which is quite uh, quite unbelievable in an organization that should know that in terms of what is the impression of that. But that is a common view, I will tell you, in corporate America, uh, as well as the issue you heard from Andrew Solomon about people just need to pull themselves up from the bootstraps. So you need to start by the bootstraps. So you need to start with education and understanding. One of the things we're doing in our corporation right now is we're having employee education sessions about the issue of depression. We are having um, one of our employees, whose sister, who also worked with the Luther Boss, who committed suicide, speak, and she's been very generous in sharing her experiences. We're having another employee who suffers from bipolar disorder also speak. Um, and these sessions have been the most well-attended employee education sessions of any we have ever done in our history. They've been uh, people lined up outside the door and sharing openly their experience as well. Everybody needs to start at the corporate level. Communication, education needs to occur to start changing those perceptions of what it is, what mental health care is all about, what mental health illness is all about. And I will tell you, it's not going to be a quick process. You know, public opinion, uh, some research shows it takes 10 years to change in this country. I think we're very early in the process, but it needs to be more of us, more of other corporations, more of you going out and offering <coughs> what mentality and others are doing at the student level. We need to do it at the corporate level. The second issue, just very quickly, is the cost of care. Because especially as healthcare costs are going up uh, at double digit rates, and I will tell you this, it's another speech, but there you will see healthcare costs going up um, like this for the foreseeable future. Healthcare costs are going to double in the next five to 10 years. And so as they go up, what you have are all decision makers in healthcare saying, we can't afford to add another benefit. We need more research to prove the point that treatment of depression can, and treatment of other mental illnesses can actually save money. And we would offer our data for the researchers here at the university to make that point. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Can I just briefly add to that, though? There's 38 other states in this country, plus all federal employees and retirees, that already have parity. This isn't a new issue. Some states have had it for five to seven years. 
There's a lot of data that shows that the premium increases are minimal and that the indirect cost savings, if there was a study done at U of M not too long ago that showed the cost of untreated depression alone in the workplace is $4,200 per employee per year. We know these things. And, you know, we have been working at the corporate level and, you know, all the data in the world doesn't seem to make any difference. I wish I could really yeah. believe what you're saying, but I've been hitting my head with a brick wall for seven years now. Yeah. Well, we'll talk about it. I think that it can make a difference. I do not think it's going to be quick, and I don't think people want to believe it. And it's got to be the twofold part. You've got to deal with perceptions of mental illness in the corporate world and the data. It's not one or the other. The last thing I'll say on it, actually, and this will be an to most of you, but I, I really think it's very important that those of you who are advocates make management of health care your friend. I know it's got lots of problems, but corporate America believes in managed care, and there are ways to make it work better. And I would encourage you to reach out to that industry that does mental health care, management health care, and make them part of the solution, not just the industry. Um, I don't think the solution necessarily lies in the business all about the next company. I'm a little concerned about the tenor of this that the emphasis is on diagnosis and treatment, and there's no anthropologists, there's no religious groups here today. Um, what about building stronger human societies? People are more accepted. Um, maybe it wouldn't down to humanizing work conditions, such as making medical students work 36 continuous hours. I mean, let's look at how the University of Michigan creates depression. We should study that, too. I, I will say that. You know, I think there are roads that can lead from this conference. What I'd like to fold into that issue and that question is, is each of the panelists talk in some sense more or less around communities, creating communities, how can we reach people's stigma with Patrick and Summer especially. I'd, I'd be interested in hearing some of your thoughts and experiences on creating, mul reaching multiple communities because it feels like what's stigmatizing to some is uh, not for the other, you know, things like that. One of the things um, to address your issue and also to tag on this as well, um, one of the things about mentality is that that really is what we focus on. We sort of focus on um, a, a, a global health, which does involve mental health, physical health, spiritual health, um, and recognizing the whole person. And that's why our group um, is really inclusive to everyone. Anyone who is related to the university community, community can be a part of mentality. It's not only students with mental illness, students, um, some students with mental illness, some students without, some with family members or friends, some with um, simply interest in social justice and things like that. Um, and, and, and that idea of bringing that holistic idea of health and well-being is something that we're really looking for. And as I said before, really trying to focus on the health aspect, health and wellness aspect of it, but looking at as a as a broader continuum. Um, the other thing I wanted to say, not necessarily related to that, but just something that I was, um, something someone was saying reminded me of it. I can't remember what. Um, but sort of wanted to, uh, oh, I remember. It was when you were talking about uh, stigma and knowledge, the lack of knowledge. Um, it sort of made me want to challenge all of us to pretend that there's no stigma. Pretend that stigma does not exist and that you talk about your mental health or your mental illness or how you're feeling, whether it's good or bad, anytime, and it's not an issue. Um, and when you come up against someone who is uneducated about that, that you educate them about it. But if we can just sort of, those of us who are aware of these things and know that there's nothing bad about it, if we can stop perpetuating the stigma by just putting it out there, and it might shock people and people might get upset about it, but more likely what happens, what happens with me and what happens with you know, many, many of the mentality students who've gone through our program is that people come up to them afterwards and say, oh my goodness, I experienced that too. Wow, I'm so glad that you could say that because I really want to tell you about my experience with my brother. Um, and I think it's really, it's really up to us to say, you know what, my stigma doesn't exist. Here, here I am, I'm out here, I'm a graduate student at the U of M, I have depression, sometimes I can't go to class, but I'm still doing really well anyways. Um, and to share that with my friends and my family and so that they feel less inhibited to talk about it. Um, so I just, I just want to put that out there that 
pretend like stigma doesn't exist. <laughs> I think with that, we will need to end. Please uh, give one more round of applause to the panel.